Okay, Galatians 5, and we're looking at, we're starting verse 14, but we'll read 13 and 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, let's finish up Luther's comments on verse 13. He says, As touching us, we have a commandment of God to preach the gospel, which offereth to all men liberty from the law, sin, death, and God's wrath, freely for Christ's sake, if they believe. So, we stop right there. Is, is Luther teaching conditional salvation here? Owen, what do you think? No. Nope. He says that we um, offer the gospel offers to all men's liber liberty from the law of sin, death, and God's wrath freely. In other words, it sets it forth before all men, but it's only efficacious to those who believe, and which is to be explained. In other places, it is not in our power to conceal or reveal or revoke this liberty now published by the gospel. For Christ hath given it unto us freely and purchased it by his death. Neither can we constrain those swine which run headlong into all licentiousness and dissoluteness of the flesh to help other men with their bodies or goods. Therefore, we do what we can, that is to say, we diligently admonish them that they ought so to do. If we nothing prevail by these admonitions, we commit the matter to God, and he will recompense these scorners with just punishment in his good time. In the meanwhile, this is our comfort that as touching the godly, our labor is not lost, of whom many, no doubt, by our ministry are delivered out of the bondage of the devil, and translated into the liberty of the Spirit. So he's mainly, as we've said a number of times before, dealing with the legalism uh, which the Galatian Christians had fallen into. But at one and the same time, he does what, Ethan? Uh, at the same time, he says that... Uh this liberty is not to be an occasion for the flesh or an excuse for lawlessness. Right. So basically he's saying, don't run over on the other side now, over to, to uh, antinomianism. These swine which run headlong into all licentiousness and dissoluteness of the flesh. So, um, he calls this the liberty of the Spirit. What does this word of here mean, G Gary? We talk about this word of. It's a very important word because it is almost always associated with a genitive case. The liberty of the Spirit, meaning what? Meaning it is the liberty which the Spirit gives you. Mm -hmm. it is this, yeah. Produced by the Spirit. The liberty which Remember that, um, America the Beautiful. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. So, it's, uh, our liberty is confirmed in law. The law directs us into the liberty that we have to, well, what kind of liberty is it then? Tom. Is that is that that is that that Philadelphia freedom? <laughs> no, it's it's liberty from being under the curse of the law. Good point. It's a liberty to be that which God has created us to be. Um, liberty of the spirit 
If we look back at Galatians 3.10, why don't you read that, Tom, since you had such a good answer. What is it? That's exactly what you just said, Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10 For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do. That is the bondage from which we have been delivered. Explain it again, Tom. Um, so we are no longer under the curse of law, meaning our relationship to God is not dependent on what we do for salvation. See that? Um, mm -hmm. Which is the bondage of bondages. Because why is that such a hideous bondage, Tom? Because it puts all the power in us and no power in God. And, 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 and how do you know that you've ever done enough? Right? If your relationship right. to God is dependent on your performance... How do you know when your performance is... Well, this is how you know. Matthew 5, 48. Ethan, read that. Uh, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. There it is. That's the standard. So if you're not perfect, then what, Ethan? If you're not perfect, uh, you're under the curse of God. You're damned. There it is, the hideousness. Oh, there's been, but you see, but the, but the natural man, isn't it interesting? This is one thing you'll find in many different realms. The natural man is impatient with explanation. He's impatient with definition. He's impatient for you to tell him, okay, so your relationship to God determines on your performance. How good does your performance have to be? Let me show you. No, he's impatient with it. Because he cannot. See, this is the bondage of it all. He cannot but. What, Tom? He cannot but think he can do something. Exactly. He cannot but think this way. What word in the text tells us that? One word. Yeah. Okay. The smallest word there. <laughs> uh, is it all? Of. Oh. Yeah. For as many as are of the works of the law. What does this of mean? Jade. That they belong to. Yeah, they belong to this thinking. Okay. Let's go. These which notwithstanding are but few, which this is encouragement to us, these which notwithstanding are but few, which acknowledge the glory of this liberty of the Spirit, and on the other side are ready through charity to serve other men. See? So... This is exactly what we were reading from... I'm going to read that again in a few seconds. This is exactly the quote that we read in the sermon today, or last night. Let me read it again. These which notwithstanding are few, which acknowledge the glory of this liberty of the Spirit, and on the other side are ready through charity to serve other men. So you have liberty and servitude at one and the same time. Explain that, Ethan. Oh, yeah, you're referring to the quote uh, that Luther went up to the mount. Right, and he had exactly. Law, but when it came down, it was a lawgiver. As, as touching the conscience, we are free from all laws. We are Lord over sin, over death, over the curse of the law. Uh, but as touching the body, we are subject to serve uh, our brethren in the flesh and do what we can for them. And you just explained the first table of the law where you keep out what? In your conscience. You keep out what, Ethan? Uh, all works, which exactly. would imply all the article of justification. Right. 
You're justified by faith and by faith alone. And then Luther says, but not a faith that is alone. See how that applies? The same thing. Explain it, Ethan. Yeah, the faith by which we are justified is also the faith that brings with it uh, the intention of doing all good things for God and for our fellow neighbor. God has no use for our works, therefore faith does not justify. Our neighbors have use for our good works. Therefore, faith works in love to serve them. Excellent. So we've been, as we've been seeing again and again and again, faith is encompassed in this love of the law. Love of the law. Let me read that quote, by the way. In our justification, driving us to Christ's propitiation, love of the law in our sanctification, which reconciles us to Obedience. Luther says, Moses, while he was in the mountain where he talked with God, imagine this, I'm trying to, try to, try to imagine it. You being Moses, while, Moses, while he was in the mountain where he talked with God face to face, had no law, made no law, ministered no law, but when he was come down from the mountain, he was a lawgiver. And govern the people by the law. So the conscience must be free from the law. But the body must be obedient to the law. Beautiful. Balance. And then he continues. Hereby it appeareth that Paul reproved Peter for no light matter. But for the chiefest article of all Christian doctrine. What's the chiefest article of all Christian doctrine? Gary. Well, that would be just the case by faith alone. So he reproves Peter. So you hang in with the Gentiles, Peter, until the Jews come around, and then you and then you leave them because they're second-class citizens. That's what you're saying by leaving them, and they're second-class citizens because they haven't been circumcised. So that was the the importance of his facing up to Peter. Okay, he continues. Um, Paul uses here very apt and plain words when he said, Brethren, ye are called into liberty. And because no man should dream that he speaketh of the liberty of the flesh, he expoundeth himself what manner of liberty he meaneth, saying, Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but serve ye one another through love. Wherefore, let every Christian know that it's touching the conscience. Hello. <laughs> there it goes again. As touching the conscience, Christ hath made him Lord over the law, sin, and death, so that they have no power over him. Contrarywise, let him also know that this outward bondage is laid upon his body, that he should serve his neighbor through love. They that understand Christian liberty otherwise enjoy the commodities of the gospel to their own destruction and are worse idolaters under the name of Christ than they were before under the Pope. Now Paul goeth about to declare out of the Ten Commandments what it is to serve one another through love. You see that? He, he mentioned this last week. See? Uh, enjoy the commodities of the gospel to their own destruction and are worse idolaters under the name of Christ than they were under the Pope. Who's he talking about? Tom? He's talking about the Roman church. He's, yeah, but he's talking about the people who have been superficially delivered from Rome, but they jump into antinomianism. Right. So he says that they uh, enjoy the commodities of the gospel to their own destruction and are worse idolaters under the name of Christ than they were before under the Pope. I've experienced that myself personally. It is hideous. The, the, the ravages of antinomianism. Okay. So we get to verse 14. Which Luther says, Now Paul goeth about to declare out of the Ten Commandments what it is to serve one another through love. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, Meaning one sentence. Even in this, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, what is Paul getting at here, Ethan? Uh, that the very substance of the law and all the keeping of the commandments uh, as pertaining to the second table is comprehended in this one word, you shall love uh, each other as yourself. And this is not to neglect the first table of the law because there is no second table of the law without the first table. Don't forget that. Gary, what do we say is the relationship between the first table and the second table? Who said the first table determines the second table? Explain. Meaning that the first table of the law um, is which deals with, with God, which deals with justification, uh, determines how we are to live our lives. Uh, right. The, right. Yeah. We're second. We're reconciled to God, and then that reconciliation uh, gives us the, the ability to love our neighbor. So that determines the second table. And the relationship between the second table and the first table is what, Larry? Well, you can't do the second unless you do your relationship towards man until you understand your relationship where you're standing with God. Okay, and the second table, the second table manifests. See that? The relationship, the first table determines the second table. And then the second table manifests or demonstrates the first table. See, that we were able to love our neighbor or to begin to love our neighbor whereas before we hated God and our neighbor as a manifestation of the fact that we're reconciled unto God. And so, once again, the Judaizers are the legalists and Paul here refutes them while guarding at at the same time guarding against the opposite heresy of antinomianism. And we saw that person that's in, been in the news lately whose father founded the moral majority uh, giving an indication of his concern for morality whereas we discovered that he had no concern for morality whatsoever because legalism always does what, Ethan? Legalism always, in time, turns to antinomianism. Because of what? Uh, because once you substitute the law of God as the standard in your mind by which you are justified and think yourself to be commended to it by your own righteousness, uh, that righteousness not having a sure foundation uh, turns into uh, lawlessness and you give, more, give way more and more to the instigation of the devil and of the world. Yeah, you start off okay. Start off emphasizing things like uh, uh, I don't smoke cigarettes, I don't take drugs, I don't drink alcohol, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not unfaithful to my wife, uh, etc. And yet, in time, even those um, tenets which you've set up in your own mind uh, as in place of the law, you don't even have the strength to keep those. So legalism always morphs into antinomianism. Okay, today we're on question 13. Did our first parents continue in a state, in the estate wherein they were created? Owen. parents being left with the freedom of their own will fall from the state where they are created by sinning against God. Okay. Um, last week we looked at uh, the question 12 which was what special act of providence. So we had two questions on providence. Uh, and then this, this was the second. This, what special act of providence did God exercise toward man in the estate when he was created? 
The God created man and entered into a covenant of life with him. Upon condition of perfect obedience, forbid him to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil upon the pain of death. Okay, we said there that there are two designations of this covenant. The, the shorter catechism calls it what? Tom. Uh, covenant of life. Right. And uh, it is also known as what? What's the other name for it? The covenant of works. Which is basically, if you look up Ezekiel 20, verse 11, Tom, read that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I give them my statutes and show them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Okay. So, the covenant of life is an emphasis on what word in the text? Live. Right. See that? Which if a man do, he shall live in them. And covenants of works places emphasis on what word? Uh, would it be judgment? If a man do, see that? Uh, Which if a man do, he shall live. Do this and live. So covenant of life, emphasis on the word live. Covenant of works, emphasis on the word do. And getting back to Galatians 3.10, what's the relationship of question 12, which is what special act of providence did God exercise toward man in the state when he was created? What's the relationship of that to Galatians 3.10, Tom? Uh, the relationship is that in Galatians 3.10, uh, Paul's saying that you are under the covenant of works. And if you don't, you can't get out of that unless um, you continually to, um, do all things that are in the law. We said that the re from, a, from a human standpoint, the reason why a person is still under the covenant of works is what? According to Galatians 3.10. Owen, did you pick up on that? From a human standpoint, how come this man still belongs to the covenant of works? Remember? He hasn't discovered two things. The discovery of which immediately delivers him from the covenant of works. What is it, Owen? Galatians 3.10 tells us. Uh, that he's of, of the works of the law. No, I say... That he must keep... Yeah, right. He, if he discovers, he has to keep the whole law, first of all, and then secondly, no let up. Okay. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. Has to keep the whole law. And has to keep it continually. Once he discovers that, Gary, what happens? Well, once he discovers that he cannot keep the law, then he has to seek the righteousness of another. Once he discovers that this is exactly what he has to do, see? Huh? He's still... He's still under the, uh, under the law. Galatians 6.14 You are not under the law but under grace. And we were under the law. And he's still under the law because he doesn't understand what is required of him to recommend himself to God by his works. As soon as he discovers that. Because see that? Can he discover? Can he come up with that on his own, Gary? No. no. See? You see what I'm saying? So, since he can't come up with it on his own, as soon as he discovers that, guess who caused him to discover it? The 
the Holy Spirit. Right. Caused him to discover, hey, wait a second. I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do the other. I have to keep the entire law and then keep it continuously. Otherwise, I'm damned. See, which is the, see, which discovery is just another expression of the most important religious question. Explain that, Ethan. Uh, I'm sorry, you were breaking up a bit. What is the discovery of the most important I said question? his discovery that for him to be uh, accepted by God through works, okay, right. see, would necessitate keeping the whole law and keeping the whole law continuously. Who causes him to realize that? Yeah, this, this is only discovered through regeneration by the power of the Spirit enlightening our minds, causing us to come face to face with the requirements that God rightly and justly demands of us, which drives us to despair of ourselves and to look for righteousness in Christ alone. Yeah, see that? And which, once again, is... Uh, just another way of saying the most important, of asking the most important religious question. Since this is demanded me of God, since, since God demands that I be perfect, since He demands that I keep the whole law and keep it continuously, how can I be accepted of God? I can't do that. So that drives him to ask himself the most important religious question. You see, now, do, do you see the relationship of this to the, to the sermon last night? With the word, uh, Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. What was that one most important word, Ethan? Uh, it was therefore. There it is. See that? He doesn't use that word. Have you ever meditated on that? The Christian is the only person who uses therefore. Because therefore is just another way of saying what, Tom? Were you here last night, Tom? Yeah, I was here. Super. Uh, therefore is the only way... Well, I had to explain it. it was, therefore is the only way that designates an assurance of whatever it is. Well, well, that, well, think of it this way. The Christian is the only person who's logical. I just put a post up a couple hours ago that if, if it were true that, okay, if, it, if, if, if what Calvinists say is true, in other words, that man is that fallen man is not as bad as he can be. What are the two words that godly men in coining a term to refer to man's fallen state? What are the two words they would never put together? Let me put let me say that again. If it were true to say that fallen man is not as bad as he can be. What are the two English words that they would never put together to describe man's state in sin? Ethan. A total and utter. A total depravity. They would never put those two words together to describe fallen man's state. But guess what? The Calvinists accept that designation. Do, they, do the Calvinists say, oh, we don't believe in total depravity? Gary, is that what they say? Uh, what, what was it that you, that you claimed that they said? I said that, the, that if it were true, that as you know, we all know that the Calvinists, the first thing they say is total depravity doesn't mean that the sinner is as bad as he can be. All right? If that is true, that the sinner, that fallen man isn't as bad as he can be. What would be the two words in English that the godly men who described of old 
in our confession who described man's state in sin. What are the two words that they would never put together to describe that? Total depravity. See? They would never describe, if man were not as bad as he could be. They would never use those two words together to describe man, fallen man's state. See? But my point is, what do the Calvinists admit? What do they call man's state in sin? Uh, they call it total depravity. They accept that terminology. See what I'm saying? But they immediately explain it away. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Larry, you follow me? stepped out for a minute, but if I, if I recall, because they can't, they can't, um, because they don't believe even total depravity, so they don't want to. Exactly. And what we're talking about is that the Christian, this word therefore, the word therefore, without the word therefore, can you possibly be distriven, be driven to total despair? Owen, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, I thought realizing you're evil, or evil and what could you possibly yeah. be, you'll never... You discover, you say, hey, wait a second. God demands that I keep the whole law. He demands, secondly, he, he demands that I keep it continuously with no let up, not even one second. Therefore, I'm damned. See, without the word therefore... You never ask the most important religious question. You're never driven to Christ. That's the importance of it. And the point I'm making now is that the Christian is the only person who is logical in the universe. The only one. How about this one? Let's look at it from another angle. Why is it, okay, that that the Calvinists, from another standpoint, they say in their, in their discussion of total depravity, they always bring up people like Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer to say that not everybody is this bad. All right? Why did they do that? Ethan, you follow me? Oh, uh, yeah, they bring up uh, heinous criminals because in their mind... Uh, sitting against God is only divine to sinning against man. They can't conceive of blasphemy, of inward thoughts of lust and excess and of lawlessness. Uh, they only think of expressing it outwardly in uh, murder and theft and all those things that even the heathen condemn as wickedness. And, and think of it this way. They trust their view of goodness. See it? They trust their view of goodness. Which is to say, they never use the word therefore. They never go to the scripture. And see, everyone that is proud in heart, Proverbs 16, 5, is an abomination to the Lord. Or look at uh, Luke 16, look, look at Luke 16, 15. Tom, why don't you read that? See that? What is most highly esteemed among men? Self-righteousness. Self See that? That's the very thing that God abominates. Therefore, they don't use the word therefore. They never do. Therefore, the monster sin is not being an axe murderer. The monster sin is self-righteousness. Okay, let's look at the last part of the... Um, Question 13, where it says, Our first parents, did our first parents continue in this state when they were created? Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the estate when they were created, 
by sinning against God. Being left to the freedom of their own will. So I, I was looking at the uh, I was looking at the at the Westminster Confession chapter nine. If you've got it on your phone or if you have it available, turn to chapter nine and uh, let's look at this. Chapter 9, of our first parents being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the state when they were created by sinning against God. Of free will. Number one, God hath endued the will of man with that, listen to this, natural liberty, that it is neither forced nor by an ap any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. Natural liberty. All right. Secondly, man in his state of innocency, what does that mean? Jade, his state of innocency. Before the fall. Exactly. In his state of innocence, he was innocent. He hadn't sinned yet. Had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God. But yet mutably, so that he might fall. What does that mean, Gary? Mutably. Mutably meaning he was capable of falling from that condition. He was capable of changing. See? He was muta mutability. We say that God is immutable. He's not capable of change. He was created in that condition, yet mutably. All right? Paragraph 3. Man by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man being all, listen to this, listen to these words, altogether averse from that good. And what does that mean, Larry? It means they have no ability to do yeah, uh, what does the word averse mean? To have an aversion. No, to have an aversion to something is what? An aversion. Um, somebody, somebody come up with it. It's to be opposed to it. Yeah, hatred for it hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accomplishing salvation. Any spiritual good. So as a natural man being altogether completely hates any good that has anything to do with salvation and dead in sin is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. He's not able to convert himself or even... To prepare him, what does that mean, Ethan? Yeah, he can't even uh, do good works that um, set himself up for it as preparationism teaches. Right. Fourth paragraph. When God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he freeth him from this natural bondage under sin and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so, as that by reason of his remaining corruption, he doth not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but doth also will that which is evil. And then the last paragraph, the will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in the state of glory 
only. So, uh, this state, uh, let's go back to the um, question 13. Our first parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the estate wherein they were created by sinning against God. Why is, why is that an important consideration, Tom? What do you think? Being left to the freedom of their own will. That's an important statement. Uh, I'm trying to think how to explain it. <laughs> Being left to the freedom of their Well, because their wills are mutable, they can... Okay, you're, that, that's, that's, right, that's right as far as it goes, but um, we're thinking of something else, and that is the importance of the fact that the, you, when you read the story of Adam and Eve and, and Eve's temptation of the devil uh, and the entire story, there is not the least intimation in the whole story that God was in any way, shape, or form involved in their fall. You follow me, Ethan? Yeah, God strictly commanded Adam to uh, not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil upon pain of death. And uh, his, him and his wife being wandering away from the will of God uh, ate the fruit of their own will, being left to it. Right. So, in other words, there was no hint of any coercion on the part of God. Though he decreed, see those, those two things we put together. Though he decreed the fall, there is no intimation of his participation in their fall. As far as um, either coercion or tempting them to do that which they finally ended up doing. Fell from the state when they were created by sinning against God. Now this freedom of will has been... Uh, discussed um, at length historically and the, the and Turretin is the is about the best person I've ever read on it. He he makes the point to say that though Adam and Eve in their innocence, as we were just speaking of, before they fell, had a a, a, what we call free will still in their innocence their will was not what it was free but it was not what are we looking for Ethan do you know uh, it was not uh, it didn't exist outside of God's immutable decrees exactly. which can change exactly it was not a freedom of independence. See? It wasn't absolute. In other words, okay, Gary, put it in the form of a question. Was Adam free not to eat the forbidden fruit in an absolute sense? Yes, he was free. He was free, but he wasn't. See, okay. So we can let me back up a couple steps. Did God decree? What are, what are the decrees of God, Gary? Well, the decrees of God are uh, His uh, eternal purpose. Yeah. The decrees of God are His eternal purpose, according to counsel of His will, whereby for His own glory, foreordain what sort of comes to pass. Okay. So He foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. Does that include the fall? Yes. All right. You see the dilemma? <laughs> yes. So, so, so God has already decreed the fall. He places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with this freedom of will. No coercion on the part of God. At the same time, Adam was not free from this decree. He was going to eat that fruit. See, you got a hold of that. So in an absolute sense, 
I see what you're saying. Now, in an absolute sense, no, he would. No, not right? Free. Yeah, because in an absolute sense, you would be saying he's free from God's uh, uh, decree. Right. He has freedom of independence. Nobody has freedom of independence. The angels don't have freedom of independence. And yet, the last thing we want to say is that is the very thing that the Arminian demands. Think about that. Have you ever meditated on that? That is the kind of freedom. See? The Arminian doesn't demand that the type of freedom that Adam had, that is described in question 13 of the Shorter Catechism. Being left to the freedom of their own will. No. The Arminian demands freedom of independence from God. You see that, Ethan? Yeah, and it even says that uh, God is so powerful as to give him a free will that is more powerful than God's will. Yeah, sometimes they say God limited himself. <laughs> oh, wow. Where do you go with that one? So, you know, man, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the estate when they were created by sinning against God. He had a freedom, meaning that there was no um, proclivity in him at the time towards sin. There was no coercion on the part of God for him to sin. At the same time, he did not have, as nobody has, but God himself. See, that's part of you shall be as God, wanting a freedom of independence from God. Now, before we finish, I was going to, um, I was thinking before the sermon last night, <laughs> I couldn't pull something up in your mind. You know, if, you get, if you get to be a little bit older, if you're young, you'll see, what you, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I was trying to think of the, we were talking about the concept of, of uh, this, um, uh, Let me look back at my notes. Well, why don't we just pray and we'll talk about this in a second. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this teaching, most important teaching of the fall, and that we had a form of liberty in our innocence. However, at the fall, we completely, totally, and completely, and utterly lost that to where we could not in our state of sinfulness we could not would not had no desire for the for the carnal man is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be Reprove. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We were talking about, um, I think, 